So we are very proud today that we are launching the second version of uh, the business playbook. So, and we even have a limited edition, which you can promise uh, to read it or share it. You can bring it with you, of course, or otherwise uh, download it and spread it. Uh, why we created this uh, playbook around two years ago? Also, I guess, in a discussion with, with Ericsson and Potsdam Institute and others, it was basically how can we transform the carbon law? How can we transform that to concrete strategy and action for companies yeah. into something which is simple and um, uh, which is simple and sharp and aligned with science? So, that is basically the background. Today we have a very exciting lineup of fantastic people, as you can see. We have, um, uh, we have Race to Zero, who will join us in a minute. We have Pels and Stockness, who will also talk about climate solutions in particular. And we have some amazing companies who will actually talk about their four pillar climate strategy, which is a framework, key framework of the business playbook, and how they're basically implementing that. And we'll also like to talk about how can we scale out climate action at the end, to bring up some ideas, how can we really scale exponentially. So I go a little bit fast forward here, I guess, <laughs> to catch up a little bit. Well, the key thing is, since we launched it, we built this backing ecosystem and basically back the playbook, which I think is a key strength. And if we're just adding up the revenues of all the companies, it's around $900 billion. So that makes the framework pretty strong. It's also supported by, it's a foundation of some of the other initiatives like the SME Climate Hub, the supply chain leaders. And it's supported by Race to Zero and very much aligned uh, in collaboration with the Race to Zero criteria. So, uh, therefore, I'd like to, Fiona Macklin, who is a fantastic climate leader from Race to Zero, I'd like you to give some <laughs> reflections on how it links to the Race to Zero strategy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, and thank you, so It's fantastic to be here. Um, hello to everyone, and brilliant to be joining you all in person again in Climate Week New York. Um, yeah, I have a couple of things to say. I mean, I think, first of all, this is huge, and it's so exciting to see um, this booklet come out and, and really provide a sort of hand-holding manual to, to support um, companies in their in their race to slashing emissions and, and halving them this decade. But but just to take a step back, sorry, I'd love to pick up on what you were saying. And I think this whole this whole sense of solutions is so critical. We're in such a febrile environment, and with undergoing on geopolitical interconnected crises, it's so important to be leaning into these solutions and for non-state actors to be really stepping up and taking their lead on providing the confidence and providing the energy. <clears throat> to others, to their peers, to their competitors, and also to national governments to really ratchet this ambition and action um, and make sure that we're, we're getting ourselves back on track for 1.5. So just wanted to sort of really emphasize that sense of solutions, pushing, which I think really fantastically comes out in this playbook. I think there are, to me, there are three things um, to emphasize in particular in this business um, playbook for 1.5 degrees that I think are, are really crucially aligned to the Race to Zero um, campaign and its criteria. And the first is um, this embedding of climate solutions into business operations, um, not seeing it as an addition, not seeing a sort of sustainability um, model or pathway as something that is outside of the business model. It is absolutely critically at the heart of the way that businesses need to operate. <coughs> and I know that an incredible panel will, will share more about that and how they're leading the way on that later today. But I think that sense of this third pillar of embedding climate within everything that we do is something that has to become the new normal moving forwards. I think the second thing to pick up on, and this is a big priority for, for Race to Zero this year, is the, the activation, the education, and the, the, the real sense of sharing this energy and these solutions throughout communities, throughout stakeholders, and throughout society. And so I think that fourth pillar on the, on the sort of policy engagement and societal activation is another critical one, because 
we are all in a room of friends who agree and you do the same thing and what we need to do is get our voice out to those um, that need to hear it and so I think what Exponential Roadmap Initiative and its companies are doing in terms of supply chain activation, in terms of engaging with SMEs is what we need to scale both regionally and also just generally at pace and throughout society. So I think that engagement, that, that policy activation and that fourth pillar and helping companies do that, showing them the way, um, is a really critical piece of work. So um, I think the, the third and, and final thing that I'll, that I'll say is that this is something that is we're not precious, and, and again, I think something that Exponential Roadmap Initiative really shows leadership in within the race to zero is these are solutions for everyone to take. They are not just reserved for the Exponential Roadmap Initiative partnership um, or just for race to zero members. We need to share these and shout about them and really welcome them as something that anyone and everyone can use. And so with that, again, just a, a fantastic congratulations for having this out here, um, but also a, a real excitement to hear such, a, such an incredible lineup of companies showing us how they're, they're making good on their promises and getting it done. So thank you very much, Sharon. So these are some of the companies back in the playbook, as you can see. And um, Nigel Topic has been part of the work as well, so we're also very grateful for that. Uh, what it is, just to recap, well, I see there's a handbook for CEOs, for managers, for employees to align the company with the 1.5 edition. And the key point is that it's grounded in the latest science and standards. So we integrated the recent standards into the playbook. Uh, also that it's developed by a high number of leading experts and companies, more than 100 basically, over two years, which makes it pretty solid. Uh, it will be continuously updated with new revisions, but we also keep the stability which is important. And it builds on the four plant pillar network, which I will give a few highlights on. We already talked about the foundation of the carbon law, which was launched in 2017. And this is, of course, a global carbon law. It's a global average. So for leading companies, we expect them to do their utmost to go faster. So we state in the playbook that uh, set the, at least net zero 24 for the target as a recommendation. But we also appreciate that uh, all the challenges for the front runners. So the need is really to do your absolute utmost to basically help tip over the economy. So that's a carbon law. You can read more about that. Uh, the foundation of the playbook are the four planet pillars, which is about cutting your own emissions, trying to at least halve them by 2030 or preferably faster, your value chain emissions. We'll talk more about that in the next session. Uh, and the third one is really integrating climate into your strategy and starting to provide climate solutions. Climate solutions which help others to cut emissions, to avoid emissions. And finally, we can't reach net zero on our own. We have to contribute to global net zero. That is what the fourth pillar is about. It's acceleration climate action in society. It's also to fund projects beyond your own value chain to help protect and restore nature, uh, and uh, also invest in technologies for storing carbon. So that's basically the framework, quite simple. And um, I won't go through the details because I think we are a little bit behind schedule. But it's very concrete. We're not talking about vague things. You know, what companies can do in your own operation is pretty straightforward, as you can see. But the complexity comes in is, of course, in the value chain, because you have the upstream, you have the downstream. The key recommendation that we provide is request your suppliers to take a goal to halve by 2030, join the race to zero. Then, of course, move towards renewable energy, transportation, and so on. But we also added something now around greening investments and cash. Because companies also have a financial supply chain that they need to take care of. 
downstream, well, you can also actually encourage your customers to, uh, to join the Race to Zero. You can influence your customers. And you need to design the solutions for prolonged product life, energy efficiency, rent, reuse, repair, and so on. Third pillar is really about solutions. Well, we need to think as companies how we shift our portfolio towards climate solutions and integrate climate to nature virtually in all solutions and projects over time. A complete portfolio as far as I see it. Uh, but also integrate climate to nature in the vision and mission statements and in all core functions. Something we talk more about is really what are the lifestyles companies are promoting promoting sustainable lifestyles in communication in new products will be absolutely essential. Finally, the fourth, which Fiona mentioned as well, we have a responsibility as companies to lobby for strong climate policy and align our industry memberships with the 1.5 vision or leave organizations which doesn't basically support 1.5. We need to put the pressure of course, collaborate with your peers, support sustainable lifestyles, and finally, uh, contribute by funding climate projects in society to protect and restore nature. We we'll talk more about that on Thursday, the Nature Climate Solutions here event. We have supporting projects, which is actually connected to, I would say directly connect to the project, yet to the playbook, which will talk about the supply chain leaders. And another fantastic project is the SME Climate Out, which is launched in the US this week as well, actually for small companies to take climate action. So with that overview of the playbook, um, we like to move to the next phase. I'd like to bring you back, Suri, on stage again. Thank you. Okay. I feel like that needed a bigger end. It's like, this is the 1.5 playbook, people. It's here. Well, let's hear a round of applause. If you don't leave with one of these, there's no going down in the elevator. So this is literally your way to get out of this room. Um, but thank you so very much for that, uh, Johan. And now it is my absolute great pleasure to issue somebody who I am a little bit of a fangirl for. So Per Absence uh, Stockness is a psychologist and a PhD in economics who so can tell me everything that I just did wrong in my solutions economy speech. He's a TED Global Speaker and serves as the director for the Centre of Green Growth at the Norwegian Business School. He's written many books, and one of them is one of my absolute favourites, which I strongly recommend to you, which is What We Think About When We Try Not to Think About Global Warming, which is such a great read for here during Climate Week. So, first hand, please come and join us. Thanks so much, Soliter, for such a warm welcome, and congratulations to Johan, Soliter, and the whole team on this amazing work and a new milestone. So I'm honored to join and share some thoughts on this. And as Soliter said, I'm a climate psychologist, but also a climate economist, and I specialize not as much in climate science as I specialize in the inside climate on how to create engagement and enthusiasm around creating the solutions we need. So I believe it should be fun and full of zest to have more profits while you're creating a better planet. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I'm trying to share also with the executives at the Norwegian Business Schools where I teach uh, MBAs and, and uh, other programs. So. Um, I share some of this uh, in, uh, in um, the new book, Tomorrow's Economy. And what I'd like to share with you is three things. One, uh, a compass for navigating, to see who's leading and who's lacking in terms of real having fun and profits. Uh, the other is a strategy process tools. So if you want to create your employees or organization on Monday morning, what can you do? And third, I want to present a growth-friendly metric um, that 
helps see not if you're in the wrong place or you're a kind of angel in the climate area, but whether to see if everybody is participating in the systems change needed to hit the roadmap. So from a change perspective rather than a judgmental perspective, where some are bad, grey, polluting, and others are clean and, and, and nice. And all this in five minutes. Um, where is my watch? Yeah. <laughs> there we go. So, um, current situation, if you ask CEOs all over the world, 5,000, is sustainability important to your company's future success? What do you think they say? Yes. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> and then you ask, have you integrated this into your business strategy? Uh, let me see, I have to check. Uh, suddenly down about 50 or 60 percent. And then you ask, what about the business case for that sustainability strategy? Have you done the numbers? Uh, I have to check. And you're down to 25 percent. And if you ask the investors in that company, have you seen a convincing business case for the sustainability strategy of the company in which you own shares? Probably not. So this is where we're at. We need to improve and get that up to the level of the talk. And the strategy tool that I invite people to join is perfectly aligned, aligned with the pillars of the, the exponential roadmap. So it's been a pleasure to discover all the overlaps. And it is quite simply a stairways with six steps. And the basic idea is that if you can start somewhere external, like with your stakeholders and society, and then you gradually increase the integration of sustainability all the way into the DNA of the organization, which is the business model, and of course, with the vision. Um, as you go up these stairs, the level of complexity or the amount of change management you have to do increases, and the amount of investments and the amount of risk goes up, usually, for a conventional business. Now, what can you do Monday morning with employees? You can just draw these stairs on a flip chart, have groups of seven to eight people sit down and use it for two things. What have we done? Which are the stairs upon which we've been standing and doing good work? And then the question becomes, what's our next step? Or next steps? So should we focus on greening the supply chain? Should we focus on operations? Should we accelerate the, sh uh, the rate of change in our product portfolio? Or should we now, are we ready to jump into circular business models, for instance? Or net positive business models? Uh, we have to do our house cleaning, of course, which is all the energy efficiency work and getting the meat-free Monday in your restaurant, etc. But that's, used, that's what people tend to associate with sustainability, but it's just very pretty much down low on the stairs. Very important, but you can't stand there and pretend you're part of the long-term solution, particularly if you have the 1.5 degree roadmap to hit. Another way of presenting green growth is to have your growth rate here in profits, gross profits or value creation, and then you, have, you plot your change in the footprint on this. You can either use the ecological footprint or the carbon footprint. Um, and then conventional growth is you increase your profits, but that also increases your footprint. This is the axis on which most economics have been moving over the last 50 years. And that's why the 1.5 exponential roadmap is so crucially important, because it's a radical 90 degree break with that direction. We need to move in this direction. More money with much less footprint as quickly as possible. And now you can process uh, or, or assess um, any organization, any city, any sector, any country on this compass and to see how far up there are they? Are we changing quickly enough? It's a race from that axis to this axis. So, um, what is needed is perfectly described in the 1.5 degree. We need to take emissions down according to the carbon law while we want to create more value for the world's 8 billion people. So this is value creation globally to 2100, and this is emissions. And if you look at this rate of change, then what is needed here is 2% is the average, 2.5% is the average growth rate of the economy, 5% is the average minimum reduction to have a chance on getting below 10 gigatons per year in 2050. That means the decoupling speed to be sufficient has to be 7%. So put that on the, on the compass, any company that is 
above this dotted line here, more than 7% is part of the solution. If you're just around here, you're part of the problem. It doesn't really help with the degrowth because what you need is to accelerate those companies that succeed in creating more profits, outcompeting their competitors, while bringing down the footprint of the economy. So this is then a way to make this happen, and we do know leading companies such as Interface or Öschstedt or the Norwegian company Tumra or Unilever, they have been delivering more than 7% per year, uh, Interface more than 20%, Öschstedt 15%, uh, Unilever 8%, uh, Tumra approximately 8 over the last 10 years. So it's fully possible for companies who want to do something to accelerate that green growth speed up there. And then, once you've done one year and plan for the next year, then you should plan up where should we be in two years' time, in three years' time, in four years' time. How, how many of these actions do we want to implement? And then make a business case for each of the next steps. But I think that's what I had on my mind. <laughs> That was a great overview. What do you see with the companies you work with? What are the major problems as far as you see it? Well, actually, what I see when I work with these executives and their companies is that they feel uh, a sense of surge of energy because finally now they're uncomfortable at being, you know, um, not. You have that that feeling that there's something wrong with what you're doing. And the tools have been usually like the Michael Porter's Five Forces or the Boston Consulting Group or doing a SWOT. And it, it doesn't really connect to the work we need to be doing. And so they suddenly feel that we use the word empowered or they, they feel that uh, now uh, we're ready to take those necessary steps. And the fun thing has been that a lot of different, very different sectors, uh, some consultant companies have been doing this, they have to be looking at their consultancy portfolio, but also very concrete industries such as construction, sawmills, and then the most fun client I ever had was the Royal Norwegian family. So the castle, the whole organization of the Royal family has now been working with the Green for Growth Six. So we have the Green Castle now in Norway. That's cool. That's cool. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so very much. Um, uh, please do take this in. Thank you so much for dominating the solutions of the week. And if also I say, also slightly dominating our screen as well. It's like, I look like a normal human being next to it. But um, uh, thank you so, so, so very much. Uh, um, uh, uh, yeah, and uh, thanks for the humor, because I think this should be fun, and our green growth strategies should have a lot of humor. Thank you so very much for that, actually, because uh, it can be so maudlin working in climate change. This is a Mm. existential crisis, um, but we're human beings, and we can't just operate within crisis and fear at all times. And puritanism. And puritanism, yes, I'm definitely not a puritan, not in these shoes. Um, so, we just heard about why this is so crucial, and about how we're going to make the transformation, but, uh, and I seem to have put the, the playbook down. So, yeah, how do businesses currently use this playbook? Well, as, as I mentioned, we, we built a pretty solid ecosystem of companies which is contributing to the development and uh, actually using it as well in different type of ways, both uh, in terms of strategy, in terms of supply chain management, and some companies are also using it uh, as a basis for their sustainability reports as a framework for that, but also to develop their strategies. And I think we have a starting point, but we need to scale it out uh, much faster together. Yes. Brilliant. Thanks. And uh, one of the things which we're doing this morning, uh, very excitingly, is Futera has joined the Exponential Roadmap. Um, but we've joined the Exponential Roadmap in a quite uh, a unique role, which is we have been granted the title of a climate solutions provider. Um, now, being a climate solutions provider within the exponential roadmap and therefore under the rest of zero is a status for uh, companies where 90%, 90% of our portfolio is deemed a climate solution. So, yeah, what is a climate solution? And perhaps we can talk a bit about how Fitella uh, 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 activates that. 
we basically for, for services companies, this is something we're developing also in collaboration with Race to Zero. But uh, uh, the criteria is basically integration of climate and nature in your vision and mission statement, that's essential. But you follow the four pillars, the, the framework basically handle, you know, all the normal stuff is called one, two, three emissions, etc. But also that 90% of the revenues uh, in terms of projects should be aligned with the 1.5 ambition. So that is a method we are developing. So that's basically uh, the requirement as far as we see it. Brilliant. And uh, Futera is immensely proud to be the first professional services company, the first consultancy, the first creative agency to meet this climate solutions provider status. Um, and I hope that this isn't a problem for the, uh, for the live stream, but it was a bloody pain in the ass because it was so much work to go through every single piece of work that we do, every single dollar, every single pound, every single euro that, uh, that Futera works on and identify how and if that contributes as, as a climate solution. Um, and one of the things which we've come to the conclusion of is that when Futera is doing business as usual advisory, perhaps we're helping to create an advertising campaign, we can do that if the client for it is themselves a climate solutions provider. So if we're working for another climate solutions provider, we can just do your absolute standard marketing uh, and communications. But if you're working with a client, which actually many of Futera clients are, who are absolutely committed to 1.5 and are working towards making that change, but are not themselves yet at a 90% of their portfolio being climate solutions, then actually our work can only be to help them pro to progress forward. We can't actually do any business as usual consulting or any business as usual marketing for them. So it's a very, very tight uh, 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 criteria. And as someone who is a founding B Corp, Futera was one of the founding B Corps, again, this was actually much harder to do. Because being a B Corp is about everything which we do as a business. It's about our employment uh, rules, it's about our direct footprint. Um, but as a professional services company, our actual direct footprint is important but not significant. Our brain print, the work that we do with our clients, is actually our scope three. And like everybody else is scope three, that's where the headache is. <laughs> and so actually it's that brain print, the work that we do with our clients, um, which matters most. Um, and so actually, sorry, I didn't make a big enough deal of that. Futera is a climate solutions provider. Woo! <laughs> yes, so, so, so thank you so, so, so very much to all of the Futerans, to all of our clients, and to um, the Exponential Roadmap. Now we've got a couple of other speakers who are going to come up and join us now who are also part of this journey and who are going to speak on how they are working within the 1.5 playbook and how that's going to move forward. So I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Head of Sustainability at Ericsson, who co-initiated the playbook in 2020, um, Max Pelbeck um, Scott, and also Emma from um, Emma Stewart from Netflix, so Dr. Emma Stewart from Netflix, who is the first sustainability officer there, to come and join uh, Johan on stage to answer a few questions. Thank you. I missed to get my, myself a mic, so if people want to hear me online, I think I need to stand close to this one. <laughs> Otherwise, it's, it won't hear. So, so that's why I'm sort of included in your space, as you can <laughs> <laughs> experience. <laughs> and as we, we are sort of super happy to sort of be back now after COVID, because we can go back to the normal two meters distance instead of the two that we were forced to have during COVID okay. time. <laughs> so uh, that is really good. Anyway. I'm supposed to talk about what we do, right? Exactly. Yeah. How to implement the Good. Then I'll do that. So uh, straight to the point, I will go uh, directly to Peter One. So uh, when we talk about uh, this, of course, as a true pioneer in, in sort of the sustainability area, we have been, as you heard, part of founding the, the playbook and the exponential roadmap initiative. Uh, and in fact, uh, looking at full value chain emissions, we started reporting on full value chain in 2007. 
So since then we have had it in our sustainability report. So quite a few years now that we have been sort of looking at the full value chain. Um, but knowing that, we also know that like uh, Futera, we have a majority, a vast majority of our impact in the user phase of our products, 93%. And then sort of 7% in supply chain and a half percent is our own activities. So it's sort of a very, very small part is own activities, but still that's extremely important to start with. So if we started reporting on, on sort of the value chain in 2007, we started reporting and setting targets for our own activities in 1997. And since then we have sort of worked with that and improved our own activities and it's vastly important. Uh, so I think that that is, of course, we have all our targets here and, and, and how we are driving things. Uh, so, so that's sort of the first pillar and reducing your own emissions uh, since 97. And uh, I think we are, we were also one of the first companies to have a, a science-based target on one and a half degree pathway before it was sort of uh, approved by Science Based Target to be, be there because everybody else was working on a two degree pathway and uh, we got approved sort of in hindsight that yes you are already on the one and a half degree pathway. So that's sort of, we're very proud of driving this and trying to improve on own activities. But the second pillar, which is the value chain, uh, I think what we are trying to do is really now moving into the new net zero we took that decision a year ago and we have 2040 as the target year. Uh, uh, as I said earlier, 93% is energy performance of our products, more or less, and the energy mix of our customers. And that together makes up uh, those emissions. So for us it's very important to work with that. But then we are then looking at how can we work with our supply chain because we realize that a lot of our customers are now moving into renewable energy. And then we need to look sort of upstream as well and complete that we talked. So I think that we will talk about later today in the next session about how we work with the supply chain and why that is important. And you can also see that we have the 50% reduction uh, target by 2030. And that looks really strange. <laughs> Pillar number three. Uh, so here, uh, as you see, energy consumption, our own activities, uh, or our own direct impact is of course important, but also as a technology company, if the whole ICT sector has around one and a half or 1.4 percent of global emissions uh, as an output, and think about that, all mobile phones, all data centers, everything, one and a half or 1.4 percent of your emissions comes from your phone, your laptop, the internet, fixed mobile, uh, your computer at home, etc. All offices. That is a really small part. But using that technology can impact at least 15%. The 15%, as we wrote in the Exponential Roadmap Initiative, and that was part of that research, is sort of existing solutions, pre-5G solutions. If we scale them today, we can reduce in other sectors, in transport, in houses, everywhere, with 15%. And then with sort of digitalization, 5G and AI, there is sort of at least an additional 5%. So a large, large part. And think about it also from, from the aspect. We are here in, in New York, and sort of, I wear the jacket indoors, and I take it off when I go out in the summer, and it's vice versa in the winter. So it's like overcompensation in housing. If you look on what is done in all the activities around climate in buildings, it's about insulation, double glazing, changing heating system, a lot of investment, a lot of time. Just by installing the digital system and controlling the heat and the ventilation much better, you can lose 15 to 20 percent of your energy cost in the building. And that goes like much faster. So I think if we talk about the halving the emissions. Okay, sorry. <laughs> halving the emissions by, by 2030. Let's use the digital solutions that are existing and scale them fast. So action in society. Yeah, I mean we had an election a week ago in Sweden, and through the we don't have time organization and so on, 227 Swedish companies said that the politicians are going wrong. They became. I mean, and I'm not 
talking about sort of one or the other block. It's about sort of both blocks started a race towards uh, escalating uh, subsidies for fossil fuels, taking away uh, the, the mix in of, of renewable uh, fuels into that, and how to create uh, sort of take away requirements of renewable energy, etc. It became sort of the totally wrong race. And here industry stands up and really says that this, we are creating green jobs. You are taking away the opportunities for this industry if you're not you're doing this the right way. So I think this is extremely important to be part of. And with that, I sort of stop. Thank you, Max. Thanks for your leadership, I would say, tremendous leadership, but also I think this uh, actually that the industry comes together, 20% of the GDP in Sweden just stating we need to remove the subsidies, we need better regulations. I think that's a great example, so there is a great opportunity actually to gather the leading industry behind strong action, not only in Sweden. Uh, I'll come back with some questions, but I think we um, should actually let, let's see, we will ask Emma basically to give your overview of how you're basically implementing a climate strategy, which I also know is very impressive. I love how Matt started talking about 1987 <coughs> because Netflix didn't exist, <laughs> and he had already developed his climate strategy by that point, so we are very late to the party. And I will also be brutally honest with you all, we didn't discover the exponential roadmap until after we had designed our strategy. But when I first looked at the four pillars, I thought, wait a second, this looks very familiar. And so it turns out that our strategy mapped quite nicely to the four pillars, um, which is a testament to the exponential roadmap team. So what I've done here is, I can hear myself on the speakers. Are, yeah. Just muscles get some mics on. Okay, my mic is working, but it's not fully good enough. Yeah. Is that better? Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, so I'll walk you through kind of how we think about the four pillars, but admitting that this is a uh, an overlay on an existing strategy, and so sometimes we find ourselves. Does that mean pillar two or pillar three? Ultimately, it doesn't matter as long as it's covered. Um, for those of you in the back, good luck reading this. But it breaks down our emissions, uh, our, our own emissions, scope one and scope two, uh, into their component parts. Not surprisingly, for an entertainment company, 80% of those fall into the production of film and television. Uh, and surprising for many, 6% fall into computing. There is a false assumption that Netflix has uh, many, many data centers. We, we do not. We rely upon data center providers like Amazon Web Services. And we also work with internet service providers to cache uh, locally the content that uh, viewers like to see in a given region. So hopefully you get a good viewing experience and uh, the internet infrastructure is, is made the most of. So the way that we think about reducing those emissions over time is a framework that I used in my own house. Optimize, electrify, decarbonize. Uh, and my children have, have been very helpful. My husband, not so much. Um, when we optimize, we first look at the systems and the equipment, the windows, uh, all of the things that are often overlooked, especially in an 1895 Victorian. And we first tighten those up and make sure that they're the most efficient possible because otherwise we're literally burning cash trying to decarbonize energy we didn't need in the first place. So that's step one, and all too often energy efficiency is, is somehow the orphan that no one pays any attention to, and in fact that's the thing that pays you back the fastest. So examples of that is we really look for uh, opportunities to change out lighting to LED set lighting. As you might imagine, those making film and television have opinions about lighting. Uh, and so it's quite hard to make changes when it comes to lighting. Uh, similarly, we try and use local crews wherever possible. That has a myriad of benefits. It generates local jobs. Uh, it uh, engenders us uh, well with the local government. But it also means we're not flying crews around the world unnecessarily. And then in the corporate offices, we do kind of the conventional uh, work with our landlords. We don't own any of our offices, so all of this 
it happens in partnership. Uh, when it comes to electrifying, here we have lots of sources of uh, fossil fuels. For some, production uh, of film and television is actually associated with the smell of diesel generators. If you walk down the streets of Hollywood and you smell a diesel generator, you think, hmm, I wonder who's shooting today. That is not a reputation we particularly enjoy, uh, but it is a 130-year-old industry that has relied on diesel generators as well as diesel trucks and other vehicles for almost that amount of time. So swapping those out for electric vehicles is something we're working assiduously on. We've actually brought in uh, more than 70 different electric vehicles of different types for the crews to try out. Uh, they love the torque, they love the acceleration, sometimes so much they go too fast. Uh, so there's lots of learning uh, to be done there. And we're now lobbying uh, Congress and other local policymakers to get more electric vehicles in more medium and heavy duty classes because everyone is focused on the passenger vehicle. Makes sense, that's where the margins are. But we need five ton trucks, we need state bed trucks. And those just aren't rolling off the production line. And then we offer free charging and things like that to our employees who are increasingly electrifying their own vehicles. And then decarbonize, so decarbonize what's left. Once you've electrified fuels, uh, you look at what's left uh, on the ledger. And that's often the electricity that you're using from the grid. So we're uh, opting into green tariffs where utilities provide them and where they don't. We're knocking on their door and asking why not. Uh, and then we're also doing direct investments um, in uh, clean infrastructure on our facilities. When it comes to our supply chain, we are uh, members of Exponential Roadmap and the Race to Zero and very proudly uh, have qualified for their criteria. We also sent a friendly letter to over 70 of our supply chain partners explaining that our science-based target is very important to us. Uh, we plan to have our emissions by 2030 and so should they. And here are the levers that we expect them to start to pull on. And those are around electrifying vehicles. Those are around clean mobile power, like batteries and fuel cells. Those are around renewable fuels, like sustainable aviation fuel, which we are buying and we cannot find enough drops to put in the jets. We will pay a premium, and we still cannot find enough of it. Um, and then we partner extensively with the industry. I was really uh, pleasantly surprised entering the entertainment industry two years ago. Uh, that it's a hy hyper-collaborative -coll space, uh, whether it's on the uh, eastern side of the pond or the western side of the pond, there's a lot of sharing that goes on. I think in many cases because this is pre-competitive, but also because people share crews, they share equipment. We don't own our assets, we rent them. And so Disney's assets are our assets, so we have all the same problems. Um, so you'll see this long list of regional sustainability collaborations that happen across the entertainment industry. And then, of course, there are some parallels in construction or events or sports that we can pull in in order to make these addressable markets that much more compelling to investors. And then, when it comes to integrating climate into our strategy, uh, one of the things we work on is encouraging internet service providers uh, and device manufacturers to take responsibility for the emissions in the streaming delivery chain. Uh, so we take responsibility for those at the data centers that are computing things on the platform, uh, as well as those that are serving up uh, a given title to you in your home. But ultimately, the internet infrastructure is shared, and you use it for millions of different purposes, not just watching Netflix. Uh, similarly, the tablet you're holding in your hand is hopefully used for more than watching Netflix. And so these are really their emissions, and where possible, uh, those companies have been taking responsibility and acting on them, but in some cases, not so much, and so that's when we go and have a friendly conversation. And we've worked with the Carbon Trust and an industry group called DIMPACT of the UK to share data to make it clear that, in fact, and Ericsson's um, research lab has been instrumental in showing this, 50 to 70% of the emissions of streaming sit with the device when you plug it into the wall. How does Netflix tackle that? Through the device manufacturers and utilities. Uh, when it comes to our own organization, we've enlisted the board of directors. Um, for them, this was a relatively new topic, with the exception of a couple. Uh, and we report to them on a, at least a quarterly basis. We've also instituted an annual ESG Investor Day, where the board, myself, uh, the woman who leads our DNI efforts, and our governance lead spend an entire day with the majority of our shareholders, sharing with them uh, what we're up to. 
we uh, have embedded our climate risk assessment into the enterprise risk assessment mechanism. So it's not a standalone exercise. It's something that's reported up to the board as well. Uh, we use our financial auditors for our carbon footprint, uh, which brings a certain level of legitimacy to internal stakeholders. Oh, yes, we know them because we have to answer to them when it comes to our 10K. Uh, so wherever possible, we're not using specialists despite their strengths in the subject matter, we are instead using the mainstream outfits. Uh, and then lastly, when it comes to accelerating climate in society, we've taken a number of public positions on policy, including the latest court case at the Supreme Court in the US against the EPA, uh, and doing direct engagement with policymakers on the Hill, uh, as well with, as with other national governments. We contributed to the Producers Guild um, the first time they came out asking the industry to have its own emissions, uh, which was just pr prior to COP last year. And then we do a number of things on the platform, including partnering uh, to shine a spotlight on the many green titles. Turns out there's about 200 of them on the platform right now that shine a very clear spotlight on sustainability, sometimes more of the doomsday, sometimes more of the solutions. We're always looking for more of the solutions. Uh, and then we wrap those with impact campaigns and launch new titles. For example, Down to Earth with Zac Efron, season two, don't miss it. It's coming out next month. It won an Emmy in its first season, and this upcoming season is all about solutions from touring uh, the continent of Australia. So we really do try to highlight those on in the portfolio, uh, but we still have plenty of work to do to move the portfolio uh, into titles and storytelling that are inspiring and climate savvy. With that, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Emma. Do we, do we have time for more questions? Okay, great. So, question to, to, to both of you. What do you see as the sort of major block through which we need to overcome if we really should uh, scale this to critical mass of companies. It was good with leaders, but we need to become many, many I'm more if you should, should succeed. To uh -huh. scale it to many more companies? Well, they yes. need to hear from their investors. Investors do ask questions, but that tends to be, where's your CDP report? Because then an equity analyst can check the box. Um, and that's kind of the least interesting question they can ask us. So I think hearing more sophisticated questions that are more sector specific from investors would be a big help. Uh, similarly, study your customer, because your customer will surprise you. Whether it's global opinion polls or our own research, we found that it's in the 80th to 90th percentile in terms of general population level of alarm and concern and those who determine or declare that climate is very important to them personally. But as Sully was saying earlier, many of them feel paralyzed because they don't know what to do about it. When a title like Don't Look Up mirrors that on screen, we heard so many people say, I felt seen, and now I can talk about it at the dinner table. And it kind of pierced that zeitgeist of what was already happening in society but the creative economy, at least, was not acknowledging it. And it was very good for our business. It was the second highest performing film in Netflix history. So talk about making wow. money and delivering solutions. Oh. Great, thank you. So I think um, one of the reasons why we are here is, is really based on, on that, because we realized when we launched the Exponential Roadmap in, back in 2018 that, that it was the same 200 companies uh, and that was before you joined, so now 201. But anyway, it's like uh, that we're mo meeting at all conferences and, and we have discussions, how can we change this? How can we make things happen on, on a wider scale? How can we get others to engage? And that's the whole idea of, of the playbook, in fact. And, and the idea behind the playbook was that, uh, I mean, uh, in fact, uh, from an Ayrton side, we said uh, we can inspire our customers, and we have done so. We have quite a few customers here on the playbook and, and on the Exponential Roadmap Initiative, uh, and then in the supply chain leaders. So that's one thing that you can do, but we can put requirements on our suppliers. So let's put the, the, the requirements on your suppliers, because then they sort of 
would like to follow because they'd like to remain your supplier. And so, so that is really very forceful, but at the same time is that we cannot leave them behind because if we are 200 companies that understand, the other million companies don't understand, so we need to help them to understand, once again, the idea behind the cloud. So that is really uh, what we said when we, when we started to work with this, is, is really how can we help other companies to scale. Also the idea behind the SME Climate Hub is also the same, how can we help small companies to get started. I think that's, that's sort of how we scale this in industry. That's, that's an excellent response, I think, for both of you. Big thanks for your leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Andreas Arens from from uh, IKEA and Rasmus Dumusko from Örstedt. Welcome. Who goes first? You can go first. Who do you like this? Nice. Thank you. Hey, good morning everybody, very good to see you all, um, and thanks for the invitation to speak, and thanks in particular for launching the playbook. I think, uh, from my point of view, having followed this space for a long time, I think it's actually one of the most comprehensive yet precise guides that are out there, and I think in particular the focus on pillars three and four, I think are really important. And your introduction as well, Soli, on solutions, I think, there was a lot of talk about solutions and the economic opportunity back when the SDGs, SDGs were launched in 2015, but then, since then, we've kind of lost track and we've focused a lot on reductions. And I think reductions are, of course, incredibly important. However, they're not going to take us there, as you're also eloquently putting it. And I think, uh, coming from a commercial organization, it's the innovation and the commercial opportunities that drive the organization. It's not the reduction. The, the, the drive to reduce things, you know, it just sounds different to people. It, it sounds different, unless you can turn it into an economic opportunity and, and or an economic offside. In many, in many ways you can. However, I, have, however, I think bringing something new to the market uh, is something that inspires and invigorates an organization in a completely different way. And therefore, I think the solutions focus is just so important. I sit on the Danish government's uh, council on SDGs and, and corporate responsibility. The focus is so much on, on cleaning up your operations. It's not about scale or about innovative and scalable solutions, which I really think is, is a key thing. And I think there is a massive potential in also bringing governments into this because this doesn't happen by itself. You only put new solutions to market if you have an economic offside to that. And I think the whole, this whole spectrum is, is one that we need to explore uh, a lot more in general. So that, those were my introductory remarks. Um, let me get to, uh, to the company that I represent. So the company that I represent comes from a heritage of oil and gas and coal-fired power, basically. We used to be called uh, Dong Energy. We changed the name in, uh, in, in 2017. The, the previous name was standing for Danish oil and natural gas. So that was really the heritage. We came, we've, we've been one of the most polluting energy companies in all of Europe. Um, and when you look at our reduction trajectory, this is really the, the story of the transformation. This is the story of our business strategy. Uh, about a decade ago, we realized that uh, the world was changing. Uh, and that realization came at the same time as our core business was hemorrhaging money. This was right in the aftermath of the financial crisis. So wholesale gas, uh, energy production in, in general was just not, from fossil sources, was just not uh, performing very well. So we took a strategic bet on, uh, on something that we had a little bit of experience in, namely offshore wind. And today, We've been a key front runner in driving that entire industry, bringing it from a niche industry that was highly expensive and very, that very few people actually believed in, to an industry that will be at the core of many future energy systems, at least for countries that have coasts and coastal areas. 
And when you then look at, at our, our sort of one and two reduction trajectory, uh, we've gone from 20, uh, 2006 to, to, to this time, reduced our, our GHG emissions by approximately 80, 87%. I think it's actually a little bit higher now. Um, our green energy generation is 92%. Um, and we will reach uh, net zero in scope one and two by 2025. We do that by phasing out, we've done that by, by phasing out coal entirely from our power stations, uh, and uh, we have one more coal-fired power station that will be closed uh, in the beginning of next year, uh, that we have been unable to convert because we have not come to a political agreement with, with uh, the customers in the area. And then by expanding our renewable energy footprint, as I said, mainly offshore wind, but also onshore uh, and solar here in the US and as well as in, uh, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, so that's, the, that's really the story of our transformation that you see in this one graph. Um, we, uh, we were the first energy, I think we actually still are the only energy company with um, a science-based targets initiative approved net zero target um, that comprises scopes one through the three. So we will be carbon neutral across our entire value chain by 2040. Um, and as, as I guess you can, you can uh, see from, from combining the previous and this slide, uh, our remaining emissions lie in scope three. So it comes from uh, wholesale gas and it comes from our supply chain. We've already reduced our wholesale emissions from wholesale gas by 50% over the past two years. We've committed to not engaging in any new um, uh, gas contracts, uh, such as with Gazprom. Um, we have a number of legacy contracts that we simply have not been able to, to, get, uh, to get out of. So we're obviously honoring uh, those obligations, but not entering any new. At the same, so once all of that goes away, the main thing for us that remains is our supply chain. We develop and we build renewable energy projects, which means that we procure a, a ton of components and we also have a lot of installation and operation activities. Therefore, we've set this target, we've launched our supply chain decarbonization program a couple of years ago. We have about 22,000 suppliers, however, only about 40 of those are strategic suppliers with longer term relationships and that constitute a significant amount of emissions in our supply chain. So we're working with them. Um, those 40 um, have, so, so looking back all, over these past two years, uh, these, these 40 suppliers, only a third of them reported on their scope one and two emissions two years ago. Now all of them do. Out of these 40 suppliers, one third now uh, has set a science-based target. So we're really trying to stimulate and drive uh, uptake of decarbonization uh, in our supply chain. We've asked all of our suppliers, well first these 40, to only use green electricity in their production by 2025. We've now extended that target to our entire supply base by 2025. So that will be a massive undertaking for us to actually work with our suppliers not just the strategic ones, but also uh, the rest uh, to drive that uh, change. Um, and as I said, the, our reduction trajectory really is uh, our uh, climate and business strategy at the same time. So therefore, uh, I don't think we can get anywhere uh, closer to having a, um, a, a core product that, that uh, that tries to deliver climate solutions. We have a vision of a world that runs entirely on green energy. We invest all of our money only in renewable energy solutions. So for us, I think, you know, going to, by 2025, 99% of our generation will be uh, renewable. And I think the next step for us really is to think about our solutions, not only as climate solutions, but as sustainability solutions. We have a 2030 uh, target uh, to, for, for all of our assets that are commissioned at that time to be net positive on biodiversity. Because I think biodiversity and ecosystems collapse is actually even a, an even bigger threat than climate. I think that is actually what's going to, to destabilize even more than, uh, than, than, uh, than climate. Um, and obviously those two are, are, are interplay or inter deeply interlinked. So biodiversity is a very, very important focus area for us. And I think 
we can do a lot with such massive scale infrastructure projects that we do, we can do a lot on biodiversity. Because we take up a lot of space, both on land and offshore. We also look at communities, economic development, etc. To integrate all of that into our project planning uh, is very important. Uh, and then, uh, lastly, on how we engage with the wider society. We try to uh, push a number of thought leadership products uh, out there that talk about uh, how we would like to see a stimulation for further climate action, what is necessary, what is required, um, what, is, what does it take also to provide policymakers with insights that is, this is not difficult. And I think what we're probably all experiencing is that the main gap on like in action is actually on the policy side. It is not companies, it is uh, not the public, it is actually on the policy side. So we really try to engage there and, and push out thought leadership products that we hope will, will help change the conversation. We partner with a number of, of institutions and there are just a free list here. But I think we can we can provide you know insights that that come from our organization, our experiences, but it's only when we, when we combine that with, with expertise from other organizations that we can really uh, bring something brilliant into the world. And then we engage a number of networks. We stimulate uh, demand for, um, uh, for Green Steel, for instance, through participating in the, in the Green uh, uh, in the, uh, Net Zero Steel Initiative, etc. First Movers Coalition has a big focus on that as well engaged a lot in World Economic Forum, and obviously I'm very pleased to now have been a, become a member of uh, the International World Bank Initiative. And I think that's probably my final remarks to repeat what I said initially. I think you said bring one book, I think bring ten books, because I think this is actually something that is that focuses on the material things uh, that you can you can actually directly take it. I, I think it is a playbook. I think we should go out and distribute it uh, a lot more. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Please, Andreas. Yes. Uh, so hello, uh, my name is Andreas Arns, uh, leader of the climate agenda for IKEA. And also thinking why we join the uh, exponential roadmap and why it makes sense. I think also from a solution perspective, but you've driven it. For me, it, it, it really comes natural because IKEA is very much like a value-based company. So if you're in the company, everybody cares, everybody wants to do something as well. And what we want to inspire with our business is to create a better everyday life for many people. And that, of course, can be affordable functional furniture, but it can also be due to something about the climate crisis we're in today. Because how can we actually try to create a better everyday life for many people if we don't do our utmost to limit climate change to 1.5? So I think it's really, really connected to um, actually our values for the energy. And also, like, when I see these slides, I always like, reduce your own emissions. I always get confused. So this is maybe my worst. Uh, because what is our own emissions? Uh, at IKEA, we say the range is our identity. So everything that we do as a business is, in a way, our emissions. So I will just skip this slide and go to the next one. Uh, because we always need to take action on the total value chain. Because we as a business, we, are, we of course care about our stores, we're 2.3%, but of course we also choose the materials which are in our products. We also design them on how we're supposed to use the home. That's a huge footprint as well. We actively work with our suppliers, which we call supply partners, on how to produce our furniture, as well as how to transport them as well. And of course, as we're also moving into serve economy, we also design for recycling, and also try to prolong the life of our product. So I would say this, in a way, is our emissions. And I think that is so critical as well. And of course, if we have different for prerequisite for here, when we have own factories, we also have very long-term relations with our suppliers. So the preconditions are maybe a bit different as well. But here I'm talking about our uh, reality within IKEA. And the vision is that we want to reduce. Currently, the goal I want to be open with that as well. Uh, the goal is to reduce by 15 percent. But ever since the science-based product net zero standard was launched a year ago. We have been aligning that to half emissions uh, by 2030. And that's been a given all of the same. But we as business also in terms of what are the business implications of this. We had a buy-in since a year ago already on this, but to also lead it with integrity. 
Because I mean, that is also important as a company. One thing is to commit that you want to do it, but what are the implications? Who need, where do we need to raise the bar? What are those actions we need to do? That, I think, is also to lead to integrity and also share those learnings with others. So it's not bragging, but it's really recognizing that this is maybe the most difficult thing that we're ever going to do in society. That's a challenge. But let's work on it together to identify those things. And I think it's so good also based on the points you have left up in the business playbook. Exactly what is it that companies need to do? Uh, yeah, and we are on track with our Also, when it comes to integrating into our strategies, I'm actually going to start from the bottom up just to confuse you all. Uh, because we're com coming with saying that the range is our identity. So, I mean, if we want to inspire people with good products, that's our identity. What can we do? Well, we have a huge potential to actually enable and inspire people to live a healthy and sustainable life. And it's kind of interesting, because for Terry, you're also helping us quite a lot <laughs> with those studies. <laughs> so it's a full circle being here today, I would say. But of course, how can we design our products with prolonged life for them and enable repair, refurbish, remanufacturing? Because we love our products, and we also want our customers to love them. They should live as long as possible. And when they rely on ends, they should be recycled, not incinerated. But of course, we can also improve the efficiency of them, but we can also work on clean the air as well, to also make the connection between clean air and climate. Because we also design furniture uh, and the products, and we can also design how energy efficient they are in customer homes. But we must also address the whole the icons. This is a funny story. When we started to look into the update of climate goals 2017, I heard, do not touch the meat. <laughs> uh, <laughs> true fact. And then one and a half years later, the managing director of food at the time, he said, I'm not, Andres, I'm not going to approve your climate goals unless you give me a plan for And all of a sudden, it just flipped. And this wow. is our new icon. So, and it's, it tastes like meat. It's kind of funny to trick friends, but your the vegetarian friend that you know, me, is then all of a sudden serving meat, which I don't. This is my goal. So I think this is also a way you can lead with your portfolio as well. But back into the more like boring, but very, very key things. How do you include it in the strategy? So we have sustainability is one of the five strategies. Most goes for most companies, it's one of the strategies. But also one of the KPIs for overall direction. So it's the climate footprint, it's affordability, and how we improve accessibility. Those are the three main KPIs the whole company is driven on. We're also working a lot to actually secure that it's integrated into all balanced scorecards. Because at the end of the day, this is not the top management decision. You need to help mid management and all of the people working operationally with these things. So it actually gets on the priority. And also must be open here. We Currently, work a lot with manual data handling, not fun, and also limiting platform as well. So, a huge part of what we're doing this year is also to digitalize, automatize the whole climate footprint report so it's become easy. So, instead of us doing calculations in Excel, uh, it's a smart solution that you do it instead, and also it removes the human factor as well. And that would actually make it cool to include it in our. 3D digital uh, product development, or how we work with machine learning and optimizing logistics. Uh, that is really key. So also enables a lot. But then also how we include it and accelerate in society. I think being partners such as this is key, where we really support uh, this type of mission, help smaller companies, but also that we address connect emissions connected to our peer supply chain. So when we engage with our suppliers, it's not just our part of production, but regardless if you're 1% or 20% of suppliers factory, we will secure that the whole thing goes over to 100% renewable energy. And we'll also enable customers to generate renewable electricity at home. And then this will be part of initiatives like this, but our other initiatives where we really not just do alignment with net zero, but really have this cascade approach for how we engage in society as well as also engage on public policy, such as EU uh, Green Deal, the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive. And then as you also wanted, how we also finance projects for green afforestation. So this is not the offset, we will not include it to discount our footprint, but we're doing it to secure resilience and adaptation. So that's pretty much our climate strategy in a nutshell according to the four pillars.
one question. Okay, one question, yes. I, I think that was an excellent overview. It, it really shows that it's achievable to do a really rapid transformation, which I think is really impressive. It's also, the Orsted model is really interesting because it also shows that a lot of companies can transform incredibly fast. And I also think, Andreas, you have a challenging business model to go in the front line and show it's achievable. What do you see as, as major blockers we need to overcome the next one or two years? Let me start again. Give me some time. <laughs> when you say one to two years, I think it's, it's difficult to not talk about the energy crisis. But I, I actually like to or the, the cost of living crisis, I'd actually like to take a slightly longer perspective. Um, because I think, I think we're looking at, at, a, at, a, at a, a puzzle here. I think everything is interrelated. And I think one of the points that, I, that, I, that I'd like to make is, uh, why don't policy makers require all government procurement or public procurement to have uh, climate targets and the science-based targets. Uh, science-based target is a fundamental prerequisite for being able to bid for government contracts. Why, why aren't we there? So I think you know, stimulating that and and thinking. And, and, and my point is, you want to stimulate a broader industry. So if you so if you ask for that, then you also stimulate your supply chain uh, or the, the, the bidders' supply chain uh, uh, actions. And in the end, you will end up driving change across steel, cement, transportation, etc. Uh, even if the, the, the science-based targets requirement that you made is towards somebody like us or whoever would would be a sort of first-tier uh, provider. Uh, so I think I think we need to see this as something that is very deeply uh, interrelated, and where I think, especially on the policy side, there's a lot. Of I'm going to build a bit what you said in the beginning as well, with the energy crisis. I think leading this agenda in an ever-increasing volatile world, I think that is maybe the biggest issue I see going forward, both within a company, but also what you were on to as well previously, where the, how government policy might actually be taking many, many years back in time as well. So I think that is the biggest challenge we have ahead of us as well. And it's a bit ironic because Climate change will only increase the volatility in the world. So it's the key is to keep that guiding star going forward. Thank you very much. I love the build. Answers only. <laughs> well, the whole ESG versus action. I think I think that is actually one of the things that many of us need to help tackle because. I think ESG is in a bit of a crisis. Much of that has come out of the US in the conversation here. Uh, at least that, that is what it looks like when, when we sit in Europe. Um, I think the whole ESG movement has been extremely important to put this on the agenda on the investor side. I, ri I fear that we risk that it becomes misguided because it does not have the action focus. And I think that is something that we need to, and that's why I think the solutions piece is so important because it, ESG is only about de-risking an existing product. But climate action is about changing your strategy and the solutions that you provide. I think that is where the emphasis really needs to lie, also from an investor perspective. So I think that is one more, but that's the whole conversation about, about ESG versus climate action. But I think we, we really need to be very good at addressing uh, for, uh, you know, all of us in this, in this, uh, in this room. Thank you so much. And I'm so pleased we got that build because I'm not sure the words ESG have actually been mentioned in this room yet. We were talking about solutions. So thank you for bringing the solutions back in. We're almost towards the end, and I just want to thank you so very much for being our BT testers. Um, thank you for letting us know that we needed to raise our voices at the back. To be honest, I could fill this room without a mic, but I know that we will focus on making sure that it's loud enough for everyone to hear going forward. I want to bring back up so, everybody in this room is not allowed to leave without a copy, but Johan, where can everybody who's watching get hold of this? Because not only is it packed with incredibly great information, but as you'll have seen, it gives you great structure for your PowerPoints. Because you can just do four PowerPoints and you've covered everything your company is doing on climate change. Come on, who doesn't love that? So where can everybody get a copy of the playbook? 
They can download it, of course, on exponentialroadmap.org. It's a free resource, and we have a few copies that you can get here. We need your we need to work together to scale it exponentially. So we also need all your ideas, how we can go to 10, 100,000, a million. Uh, and this is one piece of the puzzle, but it's just one small piece. So please use it and come back with the ideas so we can scale it. Thank well, you. it also, it feels pretty firm. Here we go, it's a thing. So is this going to be the playbook now for the next couple of years? Is this set or will there be another revision of it in like five years' time? You know, what is important, we're keeping the model. It's very stable. Uh, we're doing uh, incremental improvement, of course. So we align with latest science and the standards. But, but the key is that we will link different resources and guidelines and tools to the playbook, to that framework. So when you're looking at a particular part, how you engage you with your supply chain, there will be other platforms and tools that companies can go to and directly use, or recipes from the companies we heard here. The key point is that companies should copy what you are doing, should really learn from the leaders and just steal with pride because we can't afford just try to go net zero on our own. That's not possible. We need to share whatever we can. I think the leaders have that responsibility to share everything. Okay? Thank you. And you have just before I let you sit down, uh, any final reflections just from this first opening session of Solutions House? Final word. I think it's really, really important with hope because I work with the scientists, with Potsdam and others, we meet about the tipping points and so on. We need to absolutely be committed to that it is achievable. Uh, it is achievable to have emissions by 2030. We can do it, uh, so I'm absolutely convinced. And that is really important, so this session gives me uh, additional energy. <laughs> Thank you so very much. And I very much feel the same. It was great to see such different companies presenting what they're doing under the four pillars. And also particularly some of like pillar three and pillar four, how are you pushing for more policy? How are you telling the story of this? How are you engaging beyond the rules of your own business? Being such a core part of the four pillar strategy and equal in exponential roadmaps mind to doing the first part, which is reducing your own emissions. Because if we all take care of our own house, we are never going to get there. We've got to get, take care of everybody else's as well. So thank you so, so very much for being our beta testers. For those online and for those in the room, this has been the launch of the 1.5 Business Playbook. And um, yeah, I hope we get people at the back taking photographs. There you go, up there. Um, and um, I hope to see you at more Solutions House sessions during this week. Thank you so much to you.